That was my brother who cheered before, by the way, so uh, <laughs> thanks for being here. Um, well, firstly, thank you, Stuart, for the invite. And, uh, you know, when I think of the Oxford Union and the history that you have, the debates that you've had here and the people that you've invited, I feel genuinely humbled um, that I've been invited to speak here uh, tonight. And it's a privilege to talk to students who will undoubtedly shape our future. I'm pretty confident that all of you will go on to hold senior positions in a host of professions, from law to politics, from academia to business. But of course, whilst you are here, you have the chance to ask questions about today's world. You have the chance to challenge your tutors and professors and to seek knowledge which, of course, is all powerful. I'm looking forward to a robust question and answer session later, uh, so please don't hold back. Um, the theme, of course, of tonight's discussion is Jeremy Corbyn, blast for the past or leader of tomorrow. Last summer's Labour leadership election must count as one of the biggest political upsets in British political history. I've said this often enough, I've been a member of the Labour Party for 45 years and I've never experienced anything like it. Jeremy Corbyn's election, winning with a mandate which dwarfed anything previously given to any other leader of a political uh, party in Britain in a generation of more, will I believe be seen as a major turning point in British politics? Now, it's been all too much for some, and I'll say a little word about them in a minute. But first, I think we should celebrate the process that led to this outcome, the engagement of hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom had only marginally been interested in mainstream politics previously and who felt inspired to join the Corbyn campaign. For too long, politics has been an elite sport, increasingly the preserve of a small slice of society, nurtured at distinguished addresses like this one. So Jeremy has already let some air into a very, very stuffy room. And if he achieves nothing else, then we should all be grateful for that. Of course, some folk aren't grateful at all. They say we're heading back to the 1980s, when Labour was supposedly in the grip of extremism and was considered too left-wing to win office. From day one, the media and political class have used that as their narrative. Corbyn has been cast as hard left-wing, far left, even extreme. And that was just the mainstream outlets. The attacks from right-wing media and tabloid press were more focused and vitriolic. He is not just left-wing, they said, but a danger to the country. The man who hates Britain a terrorist sympathiser. They've set out to create a caricature of Corbyn so people never get to hear his real message. Nick Robinson, the respected former BBC political editor, wrote to his colleagues accusing the BBC's political coverage of reinforcing anti-Corbyn bias. And an analysis from the Media Reform Coalition found that British press systematically undermined Corbyn with negative media in the first week of his Labour leadership. In that week, across eight national newspapers, 80% of articles were negative, openly hostile, or expressing animosity and ridicule, whilst only 13% of stories were positive. Of course, the truth is, Jeremy Corbyn does present a very real threat. But it's not to the ordinary people of our nations. It is to the ideological consensus that has dominated political and economic thinking in Britain and the West for more than a generation. And it seems that no one finds this more of a threat than some Labour MPs. The same MPs that cheered on the neoliberal economic policies and illegal wars that disfigured the record of the last Labour government and still casts a shadow today. These MPs who refuse to accept the overwhelming mandate Jeremy Corbyn got from Labour's membership are generously described as the moderates in the party. 
I can tell you it's an abuse of language. There is nothing moderate about voting to bomb Syria or agreeing more public spending cuts. Anything more than it's extreme to vote for peace or for an end to eye-watering austerity. Such labelling simply obstructs the debate we need to have, which is, what went wrong with New Labour? What lessons can we learn and how can we craft an appealing electoral pitch for the reality of 2020, not 1997? Today's political and economic challenges are direct consequences of the failed political consensus of the past 30 years. You know, after 1992 general election and the fourth uh, consecutive Conservative government, Mrs Thatcher announced the end of socialism. And Tony Blair believed it. He declared that New Labour was now the political wing of the British people, while others in the party told us we were all middle class now. New Labour may well have believed its own rhetoric on building a classless society. Its leading figures saw a virtue in being more comfortable in city boardrooms than they did with trade unions. Now don't get me wrong, the last Labour government did lots of good things, not least in civil and equal rights, restoring dignity to pensioners, giving opportunities in education, training and work to the young and investing in our communities. But for all the good they did do, the last Labour government did nothing to change the fundamental structures of wealth and power in our society. In fact, it helped entrench them. The last Labour government built new schools and hospitals by the dozen load, but it also led the way for free school, schools through the academies, brought NHS privatisation in through the back door and left hospital trusts with crippling PFI debts. The last Labour government brought in the minimum wage but it also subsidised poverty wages paid by big business through its programme of tax credits. Tax credits signalled a refusal by New Labour to deal with the significant economic structural causes of the problem, and that is low pay and corporate greed. They were content to simply ameliorate the symptoms. Labour got tired. It thought managing the worst aspects of capitalism was the best it could do. And the new Labour brand became tarnished. The professionalisation of politics created a new political class. Political debate was out. Politicians now had to be on message. The politics of great ideals gave way to the politics of spin. It's no surprise that somewhere along the way people lost interest in politics, turnout in elections fell and the belief that politics could achieve real change was eroded. New Labour's unholy alliance with the City of London, its backing of light touch regulation for the financial sector and refusal to act on the mass tax avoidance of the corporate elite was more than a minor misjudgment, it was an indictment of Labour's 13 years in government. What people remember today is a government that started out intensely relaxed about people being filthy rich and ended with a treasury note that simply read, I'm afraid there's no money left. And to add insult to injury, New Labour's leading figures were quick to find favour in the city of London with lucrative careers after waltzing off the political stage leaving all behind to fall. And that's before we even mention Iraq. And so new Labour experiments failed. The global banking crisis and a taxpayer-funded uh, bailout of the banks raised the first big question mark over new Labour economics. It was then that people started noticing that not only had the economic model crashed, but that society was still divided with widening inequality and elite super rich and rampant corporate greed. In opposition, Ed Miliband started to grasp the seriousness of the problem, although his responses were hampered by timidity. Millions of people wanted more and a decisive alternative to the past. 
So if people are looking for an explanation for the rise of Corbin mania, then they needn't look much further than this history. And it's exactly this failed political consensus of the past 30 years which makes Jeremy's popularity today all the more understandable. He has asked the obvious questions about our society and raised the issues that the prevailing consensus cannot grapple with. He articulates the simple human decency, which tells us that cutting support for the sick and the disabled whilst doing nothing about the growing super rich can't be right. He asks, how is it right that more than half the people in our country who are in poverty are also in work? He talks about young people priced out of buying a home and unable to afford extortionate rents. He raises the obscenity of hundreds of thousands resorting to food banks simply to raise their families. He speaks to students, leaving university with debts totaling tens of thousands of pounds. These aren't 1980s throwback issues. They are the here and now reality of a country more deeply divided than I can ever remember. And that's why Jeremy Corbyn's message can and does resonate with public and why support for him is holding up so strongly despite the savage media onslaught. Of course, Stuart, the colleagues, there is another side to things. There are many who say the Corbyn leadership hasn't gone all to plan so far. Well, the truth is, and this isn't really a secret, his leadership of the Labour Party was never planned at all. He didn't stand in the expectation of winning. You know, most politicians who run for the leadership of any party have spent years preparing, assembling a team, formulating detailed policies, cultivating media contacts, hiring image consultants, and so on. And even then, uh, they still have teething problems. Jeremy had done none of these things, nor had his team around him, because until a couple of months before he won, there wasn't a team around him. That is part of the reason he won. He is not the normal, identical career politician. It's central to his appeal to a public that wants something different from their politicians. But it's also, of course, a weakness. Let's face it, lack of preparation is a weakness for most things. You'll all know that in, as you prepare to take your degrees. So both Jeremy and his team are on a steep learning curve, but not in a classroom. Instead, in the front line and under heavy enemy fire. Jeremy has been fast-tracked from the fringe meetings to the centre of the conference hall. From 30 years on the back benches to having to carry out cabinet reshuffles. It was never going to be easy. But if there is some sloppiness in the early months of the Corbyn leadership, that has not been the heart of the problem. The real difficulty has been the behaviour of a number of Labour MPs and party grandees who have simply refused to accept the results of the leadership election. They spend their time plotting behind the scenes every week that passes produces another coup plan or running to the media to attack the leader and the policies that party members voted for. And this has made it hard for Jeremy's voice to be heard or for him to get across his message. Every issue is turned into a Labour split. Now, of course, there is a problem here that requires careful handling. Jeremy derives this huge mandate from the party membership and its affiliated supporters. On the other hand, his committed support in the Parliamentary Labour Party is much smaller. As I say, it's a sensitive issue and that's why I'm not a supporter of going back to mandatory reselection or other changes designed to intimidate or undermine Labour MPs. But I also believe that we need to issue a clear warning to those who are advocating that the Parliamentary Labour Party be used as a lever to force Jeremy Corbyn out. The bizarre, bizarre plans outlined by Joe Haynes, Harold Wilson's advisor, there's a blast from the past, and pollster Peter Kellner, the call to arms by Damien McBride in his Times article, 
and the ludicrous 99 days notice given by Michael Duggar to the Arch Tory Mail on Sunday newspaper all have to be dismissed with disdain by any real Labour supporter. If the right-wing Labour MPs want something constructive to do, then start working out policies and ideas that might help attract voters back to Labour. The leadership election revealed just how much the new Labour faction had run out of political impulses. They offered no answers to big questions of inequality, economic management and 21st century social justice. There were certainly no big ideas from what were dubbed the Main Street candidates during the last leadership election. And remember, the leading Blairite candidates, the standard bearer, Liz Kendall, got just 4.5% of the vote. Their analysis of Labour's defeat in 2015 was unconvincing, their proposals stale, minimalist and uninspiring. And for the most party, they have still not shaped up uh, after Corbyn's victory. Until they can do that, they are a plot without a programme and a cabal without critique. Some have sought to excuse their disloyalty to Corbyn by pointing to his own rebellious past on the back benches. But who can seriously argue that his votes in Parliament against the Iraq war, against ID cards or against university tuition fees now diminish his ability to lead the Labour Party on all of these issues? He was not only right, but I believe he was giving voice to the views of most Labour supporters. I'm not saying that any Labour MP should have to abandon his or her own ideas or cease to articulate uh, that, them within the party's democratic structures. But I am saying that this continual war of attrition in, is achieving nothing beyond taking the pressure off the government. So my clear message to the plotters is stop sniping, stop scheming, get behind Jeremy Corbyn and start taking the fight to the Tories. Jeremy Corbyn's message, his authenticity, his radical challenge to the status quo is part of an international movement against business as usual politics. In Europe we can talk about Syriza in Greece and Podemos in Spain, but for a moment just look across the Atlantic. By putting his socialist principles at the forefront of his campaign, taking on the injustices of inequality and of the super-rich elite, Bernie Sanders has seen his popularity soar and his challenge for the White House taken seriously. The senator from Vermont hasn't changed his message to fit with the public mood. He's been banging on the same political drum all his life. Tad Devine, Sanders' top strategist, says his campaign has the potential to change the composition of the electorate, getting young people and lower income voters into it and on the side of the Democrats because his message is so powerful and believable. The global political and economic problems are so stark that they can no longer be ignored. Politicians who are willing to talk frankly about them will be listened to. So we need to sharpen and clarify our message, confident that there is a growing re receptive audience. At the 2015 general election, Labour was anti-Tory cuts, but not anti-austerity. It was a muddled message that failed to convince many people. Now we have a clear message, one that rejects austerity economics and promises investment and growth instead. Fairness, tackling corporate greed, tax avoidance and tax evasion and holding power and wealth to account. All popular proposals that are resonating on both sides of the Atlantic. What Jeremy Corbyn offers like Sanders in the US is calling out of corporate corruption. A rejection of austerity that has made the UK the most unequal economy in the G8 and the promise that politics and politicians can and will put things right for ordinary working people. But Labour cannot simply go back to where it left off in 1997 or 2007 or even 2010. Many of the problems the country faced then have worsened and there are other brand new ones as well. 
So what does Jeremy Corbyn have to do to be a leader of tomorrow, our next Prime Minister? It's right to say that it's not enough for Labour simply to point a finger at Tory hypocrisy. The challenge the Labour Party faces today is to prove to working people, to all people, that it's on their side. Yes, it'll always be there defending the poorest and challenging the Tories' ruthless attack on welfare. But I accept the view that this is not enough. We have to set out a new agenda on building the modern productive economy that delivers security and prosperity for all working people. In short, Labour must show that it can best express the emerging consensus in favour of a more powerful role for the state in tackling social and economic problems, the resolute action needed to tackle inequality and its consequences, the need to address the insecurity that millions of people who are not badly off nevertheless still fear for the future of their jobs, of their living standards, of their homes and their children's prospects, and the rebalancing of our economy away from its overwhelming reliance on financial services. As leader, Jeremy Corbyn has already overcome a number of political hurdles placed in his way. On Syria, he spoke out against extending British military involvement, but allowed the free vote demanded by a small clique in his shadow cabinet. A very big majority of Labour MPs voted with their leader and at the same time reflected the views of the wider British public, despite all the fuss at the time. On tax credits, George Osborne was forced to reverse cuts that would have hit the lowest paid working the hardest. And Labour peers are working hard today to defeat some aspects of the Tories' malicious and vindictive trade union bill, a piece of legislation that nobody seems to support except the Prime Minister and his Cabinet, which in some of its provisions does not threaten trade unions as much as they threaten democracy itself. So there are reasons for Labour to be confident. Polling tells us that on key issues, a majority of voters back left alternatives. From taxing the rich more to renationalising the railways and utilities. Now, there are warnings that another economic crash may be around the corner. Indeed, some are penciling in 2018 as the day when that might happen. I guess that's when a number of you might be uh, graduating. The weakening position of China will have ripple effects around the world and Britain is particularly vulnerable. With an economy only kept on tracks by fueling private debts and a housing bubble and no answer forthcoming on fixing its critical structural failings, the Tories will have their way cut out winning over new supporters. So this is the moment for a clear and confident Labour alternative. The energy and enthusiasm of last summer's leadership election campaign needs to be sustained all year round and taken to a still wider audience. It's about, as the saying goes, a new kind of politics, one that can engage and enthuse non-voters as well as our traditional supporters and that can win over waverers as well as mobilising the committed. The Labour Party, let's remember, was founded to overturn the establishment consensus of a hundred years ago, to give working people a voice in politics and in government. Challenging the establishment has always been Labour's calling, something that was forgotten but has now been rediscovered. And that's why I'm confident that Jeremy Corbyn, who embodies much of the best of our past, is also the man for the future of our country. That's what I hope for. Emily Dickinson puts it better in a lovely poem. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Ladies and gentlemen, there may be some amongst you who want nothing more than a big house and a Porsche. Well, good luck. But I hope most of you can look beyond that. You are the future. Your whole life that lies ahead of you, I hope, will be fulfilling. 
Be determined to make a mark. Be determined to fight for a better Britain, a fairer Britain, and a more peaceful world. Thanks very much for listening. Well, thank you very much for that, Len. Um, so I'll start off, as usual, with a few questions myself before opening it up to the audience. Um, so you speak so passionately and you clearly have very decisive views on all aspects of politics. Um, did you ever seriously consider running for politics, well, for a political position, uh, council or parliament yourself? No. Um, no, when I left college, I... I uh, went down to work on the Liverpool docks and got involved in trade union work right away. I was, I guess, a lot of you are 19 years of age in this room. I was 19 when I became a shop steward and uh, the rest is history, as they say. I was engaged in lots of struggles um, and I suspect it's been that way ever since. Remember, I was a child of the 60s, so revolution was in the air. Um, <coughs> And not a lot has changed uh, in terms of my outlook on trying to create a better Britain. And I know uh, that's why I finished by urging all of you to do the same. Um, seek to leave your mark and hope that it turns our society into something better than it currently is. Um, so if we could move to the hot topic right now really, which is the trade union bill, mm -hmm. um, which you touched on at the end of your uh, speech. Um, why do you think the government is bringing this bill in now at a time when union engagement is low and strikes in general are so low? Well, uh, a great question to it. You'd have to ask the Prime Minister. I mean, I think it is because that this government is ideologically driven. They believe that uh, um, a public is bad, private is good. Uh, they still are locked into the concept of a laissez-faire free market economy. And they recognise, uh, quite rightly, that the only organisation that stands in the way of them doing anything they like and their friends anything they like within, uh, within the, the economy are trade unions. And so they've locked into this attack on trade unions. It harps back to a belief that you always have to stand up for uh, trade unions are the enemy within. Completely different, incidentally, from how other European leaders uh, look at their trade unions. If we take Germany, the, the most vibrant uh, European economy, the unions are very much part of the uh, manner in which uh, the business is run and conducted. But this Conservative Party seems to see the unions as the enemy within. And so they are looking to uh, weaken our position. And let me just say this to you. How I get angry, I'll try not to get too angry when I say this. How is it feasible that the nation that at the end of the Second World War, which defeated fascism and gave Europe all of the freedoms that they currently enjoy, all of the freedoms that are currently enjoyed in Europe were given by this nation of ours, how is it possible today that German workers have got more protections than British workers or Italian workers or Spanish or French have all got better protections than British workers? It's a, it's a disgrace, it's a stain on the British uh, um, uh, way of life and of course consecutive governments are responsible for it, including the Labour government. So this latest attack is 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 awful and i know the details of it are a bit boring sometimes to look at but if you can consider for one minute that there's a whole range of organizations who oppose it the police federation opposes the cipd which is the professional body that looks after um, human resource managers have said this will take us backwards liberty amnesty international a whole range of uh, individual um, uh, church and faith groups have rejected it out of hand and said, what's this about? A number of Tory MPs have questioned the whole issue of civil liberties, which is why currently at the moment in the House of Lords, and I've, 
I've met the leaders of the Conservatives uh, um, in the House, the Liberal Democrats and of course Labour. And there is deep concern, including the crossbenchers, about the whole nature of the civil aspect of the trade union bill. So I hope when you get a chance, when it starts to kind of reach uh, a particular prominent stage within, uh, within the media, I hope you'll take some time out to just reflect and ask the question, who is in favour of Vince Cable? put it the best for me, he said it's depressingly ideological and absolutely unnecessary. So it seems that one of the main ways of combating this bill would be to up union engagement. Um, how do you go about that, at a, as, I say, as I say, at a time when it is so low? Yeah, well, um, the Prime Minister says that his m major concern that he has is the low turnouts in industrial action ballots. And I agree with him on that. I'm concerned about that. That's why I wrote to the Prime Minister and asked him would he consider, uh, and that's why he's brought in this 50% threshold. I wrote to the Prime Minister and said, if you would consider a more modern method of balloting, rather than currently trade unions have to have postal ballots um, for their members who are engaged in industrial action and postal ballots are notorious for having low uh, turnouts. So what we've argued with the Prime Minister is to say, give us more modern methods of balloting, give us, um, give us electronic balloting, give us workplace balloting that is secure and independently run. If you do that, Prime Minister, <coughs> Unite, and I can only speak for Unite, we've stepped slightly outside of the TUC on this, we will accept the 50% threshold. Um, because if he doesn't accept this olive branch, then the belief in many people's minds that actually this is just an attack on the right to strike, the fundamental right to strike, then he'll be exposed. Because if his real belief is about uh, the turnouts, then he should be doing something to improve turnouts. And let me just finish quickly on this point, Stuart, if I may. Currently, there is a government body that uses that. Actually, when I've raised this with Sajid Javid and other members of the, um, of the, uh, of the cabinets, uh, they weren't sure what this was about. The CAC is the Central Arbitration Committee. It's a government body. And it's a body that when unions are trying to organise in a workplace and gain recognition, if the employer won't give that recognition, uh, then the union can go to the Central Arbitration Committee, government-run body, who then organise a ballot uh, for the workforce to decide whether they want a union or they don't want a union. And that's a workplace ballot. So it's already in operation. There's no reason why the... Uh, the government should press this forward unless the sinister reason is to try and take away the right to strike. And uh, another controversial aspect of the bill is the opt-in funding um, as opposed to well, opt out. Yeah, I mean, if this was happening in a faraway country, uh, then there would be howls of uh, derision from both the government and the media. Here you have a, a government who is enacting uh, legislation to deliberately attack the funding of its main uh, rival, its main political rival. They're going to try and attack the trade union political funds so that it reduces the figures being talked about or something like £8 million to the Labour Party. If that was happening in a, in, in a far-off country, in a third-world country, we'd be saying how disgraceful, you know, an attack on democracy. And... Uh, again, that's where Liberty and Amnesty International and others are feeling uh, uh, absolutely outraged. And it's why the Lords, uh, the Labour Party, have been successful in moving this particular element of the bill into a committee stage. And we know for a fact that there's lots of Conservative Lords who are deeply concerned about the breaking of an agreement because some people are saying, well, hang on a minute, if we do this, if Labour ever get back into power, then uh, why won't they introduce legislation to make it almost impossible for 
companies and major donors uh, who plough significant mon amounts of money into the Conservative Party. So it is a, a real problem. Uh, but let me say this, we will make certain, in Unite, we're in a strong position, we're a powerful union, a powerful force for good, I would say. Uh, and we've got no intentions of allowing any element of this bill to stop us from being an effective trade union. We'll continue to support our Labour Party um, and we can only hope that the forces who are opposed to what this government is doing will eventually be such that the government will have to take a step back. But why is opt-in funding objectively bad? Uh, it seems that if union engagement is increased as you want it to be, then why is it a, a bad thing to say that okay, everyone should opt in rather than opt out. It seems that the default should be to contribute money rather than the default to give the money. But we already opt in. Uh, Labour Party <laughs> introduced, um, Ed Miliband introduced uh, quite controversially at the time, although from a personal point of view, in my union, we, we accepted it. They introduced a system, la Labour affiliates, our members pay into a political fund uh, out of the one and a half million members that Unite has, about 1.1 million pay into the political fund. Um, and in order to then affiliate to the Labour Party, what the Labour Party said is, we now want you to ask your members individually, are they prepared to allow that money to go into the Labour Party? Uh, into the Labour Party? We've accepted that. So that change has already been embraced by... Uh, by the unions, uh, called the Collins Report, uh, Lord Collins, who did a report on it. Um, and where there's a period of time, a transitional period, but we're working towards that. We've been quite successful in going to ask our members. So I haven't got any problem with that. What the conservatives are, are doing, and the hypocrisy of this, is of course, they're, they want to change something very quickly. They're talking about giving us three months to do it without any reference to how they are funded by big business. There is no kind of uh, approach to say, well, hang on, we, uh, uh, there, there needs to be a whole host of different um, steps that sh should be gone through before companies can make donations. Who, who gets a say in that, the shareholders or what? So it's a complete imbalance, which is why it's been, um, why it's been attacked by so many different organisations. And you spoke about in your speech that there are so many people who are opposed to this bill, you know, from Conservative MPs to more natural um, opposition, such as Unite. How would someone like Jeremy Corbyn, indeed would it be Jeremy Corbyn, to unite everyone, but how would someone go about uniting all the opposition, given that it is so varied? Well, uh, unfortunately, Jeremy Corbyn doesn't have a magic wand to do that. And as you say, uh, uh, things uh, are or varied organisations, but you raise a campaign and people will join that campaign if they are uh, committed to the view. Now, I don't believe Labour has done enough uh, at the moment, uh, in particular on the issue of political funds that you've just raised. They should have taken that completely out of the trade union bill and set up a separate campaign, which would have involved um, not only amnesty and, and liberty and other um, civil liberty groups, but church organisations, faith organisations, as well as a whole plethora of people that I think would have been a powerful voice. That's how you set campaigns up. And the Labour Party, I think I hinted in the speech that Jeremy Corbyn and his team are still on a learning curve. They're tr still trying to figure out how you lead, how you kind of give the impetus or you put into practice the vision that he has. And he's still working on that. He's only been in power, you know, four or five months. So it's a work in progress. And on this particular issue, the House of Lords, the Labour House of Lords, linked strongly with the Liberal Democrats in the Lords, are uh, much more effective at the moment on this aspect and other aspects. We we hear that the government are concerned that they will lose a vote in the Lords on certain elements of the bill when this bill goes to the Lords. 
every amendment has to be voted on separately. And so there's issues on electronic balloting that there is a fear within the Conservative Party that they will lose a vote in the, in the House of Lords. So within the House of Lords, there's a fairly effective uh, opposition at the moment. Externally, outside of Westminster, that campaign needs to be uh, worked at and we need to continue to try and raise people's consciousness. And a final question from me before we open it out to the floor. Um, but just moving back to Jeremy Corbyn. So in the, the run up to his victory and indeed since then, um, among students and indeed among many other people, there was a term red Tory that was being used. Um, do you think that that was a fair assessment of <coughs> some of the people in the Labour Party and would you ever use such a term yourself? No, I think it was offensive. It's not a term that I would use um, and I think it's offensive when it is used. You know, the Labour Party, since its inception, you've heard this a thousand times, you've read it a thousand times, is a broad church and since its inception it has had a whole range of different views um, and they've always been accommodated inside of the party. I think my fear, I've been a member of the Labour Party for 45 years and I've seen the party move and lose a radical edge. That's precisely why we lost Scotland. Uh, Scotland had this magnificent history of being radical edge of social justice and we lost that as a result of which the SNP stepped into the vacuum that was left and have virtually, virtually wiped out. Uh, it's almost a one-party state in, in Scotland. Um, so it's about maintaining a proper radical edge. What do we stand for? The term Red Tory is used because people got frustrated that Labour politicians, especially senior Labour politicians, seem to be articulating the same kind of policies um, as, the, as the Tories. They seem to be going along with the, the financial global collapse of 2008 and, um, uh, and the need to uh, put neoliberalism back together again. That's where the term comes from. It comes out of frustration. I disagree with it and uh, I believe in open intellectual debate within our party so long as people can be passionate but so long as it's conducted in a civilized and a con comradely way then uh, my experience tells me that that type of debate you always emerge from it stronger and more focused thank you very much <coughs> so we'll now open up questions to the floor if you'd like to question, ask a question Please, please raise your hand high in the air. A microphone will come round to you. It does not amplify your voice, though. Um, it is just for the recording. So uh, we'll go to the uh, member just here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I think you said earlier... Can you just give me your name? Oh, sorry, I'm Tom. Tom. Hi. I think you said earlier that um, Jeremy Corbyn was a work in progress. When do you think he'll be ready? <laughs> I don't know, Tom. I don't know. I mean, a work in progress uh, speaks for itself. I see signs of improvements, and it's not just Jeremy, it's, uh, it's the team around him. You know, uh, it is fascinating, and I know many of you who go into politics uh, later in life will find how fascinating it is behind the scenes. The amounts of people, it's not just a single individual, there's a whole plethora of individual members of his staff who are given tasks to do things. Same with the shadow cabinet and the Parliamentary Labour Party. And at the moment, um, uh, and I said to, to you in my speech that in the past, in all political parties, anybody who had an ambition to run for leadership would, would have all of that in place. They'd already have polished down their, their chief of staff and their director of communications. They'd already have built up good relationships with... Uh, uh, with the media, they'd all had we had policies in in place, external bodies that were ready to lock into, so that when they win, it's kind of uh, seamless the transition. Jeremy doesn't have any of that, so and neither does his team. They're all working hard, but they're all good people. They're all decent people, 
and they're trying to improve. And I can see, I can see that improvement. Uh, I can see that happening. And I'm looking forward to, to the months and years that roll on because those that kind of dismissed and laughed at Jeremy when he first put his name forward and suddenly panicked like mad. Um, I think they might uh, have to have the smile on the other side of the face in, in not too long. Remember, the establishments, the ruling elites, the media, don't attack Jeremy Corbyn because they think he can't win. It's because they fear that he might win. And so for me, it's a question of give him time. Let's see how that develops and rolls out and let's enjoy the ride as we go along. What would you say to the members who, of the Labour Party who have left since uh, Jeremy Corbyn was elected? Oh, they're, they're absolutely perfectly legitimate. It's like, you know, if you're a member of any organisation, including all of you, will be in all kinds of different associations and organisations here. If you're a member of any organisation and it doesn't speak with your voice or have your vision, you only have two options. You don't have three or four or five options. You only have two options. You can either stay and try and change it or you can leave. And I have no problem with individuals who say, you know what, this is not the Labour Party I uh, believe in anymore. I'm leaving. Good luck to them. That's their democratic choice, of course. I'm much more interested, and there's been a few thousand of them, by the way, I'm much more interested in the 200,000 of people who've joined the Labour Party. A lot of young people, Corbyn's uh, campaign was extraordinary. His headquarters, incidentally, was Unite House, uh, Unite House in London because um, my executive decided to support Jeremy. And I used to go in there, coming away from meetings like this, eight, nine o'clock at night. And the place would be full of people, predominant young people, four, five hundred people in, uh, in our building on mobile phones doing phone banking. The enthusiasm was electric. And, you know, the media and the establishment constantly tell us that young people are not interested in politics. Um, well, uh, Corbyn's election certainly blew that one out of the water because there are literally tens of thousands of young people engaged and they're the people I am delighted with. But those who don't uh, wish to stay, that's their democratic right and I don't attack them. Thank you. Uh, so another question uh, from the floor. Uh, we go to the member on the edge with the glasses. Just here. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned in your speech how um, the Labour Party was formed sort of for greater social justice and the interests of like the working class, which is why I think it's quite interesting how Jeremy Corbyn sort of shifted his position vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. I mean, he used to be a huge Eurosceptic, now he's sort of uh, fighting to stay in Europe. And one of the arguments that I think should be posed directly to him is that surely the European Union, to a certain extent, is a part of the problem in terms of the way uh, the, the working class working class workers like plumbers and, and things like that are sort of um you know f have had their wages reduced as a consequence of like the european union so what do you what do you make of that well it's a huge question obviously europe we're going to have a referendum people are telling me it's going to be the 23rd of june um it's going to be a toss of a coin incidentally because of course the those that want to stay in Europe, the Yes campaign for the, the stay in Europe, um, are basically going to be asking people to vote for the status quo. And nobody really likes the status quo. In fact, as I look back in, in my history, the one constant is I've always been opposed to the status quo. I've always wanted, um, I think it's the Blakey in nature of uh, how I think that without opposition there is no progress so I've always been opposed to the uh, status quo and what happened in Scotland was similar for when their referendum on independence the yes campaign was electric because it was offering something different the no campaign was as dull as anything because it was asking for people to vote for the status quo and we've seen the panic that that sent and I think we'll have a similar problem with the referendum. My union is pro-Europe. So I've got nearly a million members who work in the private sector in manufacturing. 
and all of the manufacturing companies I deal with want to stay in Europe, so we will be campaigning uh, to stay in Europe. Um, but I am very, very conscious of the point you make. We won't be campaigning for the status quo. We'll be campaigning on the basis of, yes, we want to stay in, in Europe. However, there does need to be radical change in Europe. The social charter, the social element that was interwoven in the Treaty of Rome is, uh, has been eroded and uh, British workers and workers in general, uh, um, uh, their, their protections, in particular British workers, have been attacked. So we'll be arguing for a better Europe for, for working people. But the point you make is um, a powerful one. Jeremy, of course, is, it's like I said before, he's been a backbench MP who could say what he liked um, for the past 30 years. Um, when you become a leader, you have to be more nuanced in how you respond. And therein lies the challenge to him. He's got to retain his authenticity and his honesty, whilst at the same time, he can't just say the first thing that comes into his, uh, into his mind now. He has to be more nuanced. And on Europe, the issue within the Labour Party is a nuanced argument. The vast majority of Labour... MPs are pro-European and Jeremy as the leader has to take that into account and so it will be interesting to see that's why Labour for example are not uh, joining any platform with the Conservatives or the Liberal Democrats uh, there will be a Labour Yes campaign and it'll be interesting to see what the Labour Yes campaign is arguing for um, so uh, I think all of us uh, will be holding our breaths as we come up to June the 23rd. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder, if I point to you, then please uh, introduce yourself with your name. Um, if we could go uh, right to the back, there's a member with a watch in, in the air. I can see nothing more than that. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Adam. I'd just like to ask, if Jeremy Corbyn has such a strong mandate and so much support within the Labour Party, how are the MPs that you've criticised able to so consistently undermine his leadership and mount a serious threat to it? Well, because unfortunately the Labour MPs, and it's not all of them, remember, I would, I would imagine that within the parliamentary Labour Party you've got a number of very vocal uh, right-wing MPs who simply do not want to accept what has happened inside the Labour Party. Before the general election, Labour had 180,000 members. We now have just on 400,000. There has been a mass uh, influx. The outcome of the leadership election was astonishing to everybody, including me. The mandate, the manner in which uh, Corbyn won, was a landslide. And remember, the, I, if I, it's always difficult to use labels like right-wing or Blairite, even though I did use them. But Liz Kendall was the standard bearer of the views held by many Labour MPs. She got 4.5% of the vote. And so... What, Adam, the MPs have to come to terms with is uh, what has happened. Otherwise, they'll, con they'll start to run into problems within their own constituencies. I made the point that I'm opposed to mandatory reselection of MPs or things that undermine uh, uh, MPs and start to make them fearful. But I am a huge believer in accountability. I have to be accountable myself. And if some of these MPs continue to behave in the reckless manner that they do, then they will be called to account by their members within their own local constituencies. Thank you for your question. Um, if we could uh, come to the member on the edge here. Hi, uh, I'm Tom, and um, what a lot of the statistical analysis that came out after the general election and also after Corbyn um, won the leadership election was that even if Corbyn's able to carry out um, what he thinks is his mandate to try and get as many people as possible to vote who currently don't, so um, the young and traditionally uh, Labour-supporting groups, 
that still won't be enough for him to win the general election if he isn't able to convince people in swing seats, so Tory Labour swing seats. What do you think is Jeremy Corbyn's appeal to the people in swing seats who are relatively well-off um, English people who might be slightly uh, unnerved by yeah. attacks on private businesses yeah, and tax a, cuts? It's a good question, Tom. I actually touched upon it in my speech. I mean, Labour, of course... Uh, is the party to try and protect the vulnerable, you know, the bedroom tax, the attack on welfare for disabled people and sick people. Yeah, we know all of that. But the vast majority of both my members and uh, the general public uh, sometimes don't feel that they're affected by all of that. That's why Jerry has to put together a very strong narrative about an alternative economic um, uh, 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 program. Uh, John, uh, John MacDonald, the Shadow Chancellor, made a speech at the Labour Party conference last year, which I think will go down as historical, because for the first time we had a Chancellor or a Shadow Chancellor of any political party actually standing up and saying, I'm opposed to neoliberalism, we're opposed to austerity, we believe in investing. And currently, the so-called... Um, the so-called increase in, in, in uh, uh, economic growth is driven by personal death. There's all kinds of economists, there may be some economists amongst you, who will tell you that there's a deep fear that we're on the brink of another collapse because there is no sustainable growth in the economy. So what Jeremy and John have got to do, they've got to put together an argument that says that we're going to invest in our manufacturing base again. We're going to start making things again. Because a vibrant manufacturing base which brings in appropriate tax revenues, dealing with tax avoidance at the same time, it's a vibrant um, uh, manufacturing base that will give you sustainable growth in the economy. And with sustainable growth, you're able to provide decent public services. You don't know anybody, any member of your family or friends, who if you ask them the question, do they want less public services? You don't know anybody who says yes to that. Everybody wants more and better public services. But the only way you can get that is when you've got sustainable growth within the economy, and that has to come from a manufacturing uh, base. That's what Corbyn and McDonald's have to do. They're working on that narrative. We've just seen the steel industry. The steel industry is a foundation industry. Should come as no surprise to you that in Germany, Germany produced four times as much steel as we do. And yet at the moment, our steel industry, because it's owned by uh, foreign companies, is on the verge of collapse. I met Sajid Javid over it and I said, how can you have a manufacturing strategy that builds up our manufacturing base, whilst at the same time you're allowing the steel industry to go under. And so what Corbyn has to do, and you are spot on, he's got to appeal to people who currently are de decent jobs, de not, just, not just the millions of people who are on zero hours contracts, which is the scourge of our lifetime, but on the, the basis of offering something. De you know, I went to work on the Liverpool docks and I can tell you, uh, just 50 years ago we're talking about now, less than 50 years ago, dockers used to come down to work uh, of a morning, looking for work. They'd stand in a hall twice, three times as big as this, just to get a day's pay. And bosses would walk amongst them and tap them on the shoulder and give them a brass tally, uh, which would get them a day's work. And when the bosses were tired of it, they throw the tallies up into the air and watch men fight each other. And I mean fight each other, because it was the difference about putting food in their kid's belly. That was zero hour contracts back then. It's come back again. And so we have to appeal for them, but we also have to appeal to people who've got decent jobs, live in a nice home, but are still worried about security. And that's what Corbyn and MacDonald have to do. And it's a challenge I think they'll rise to. Thank you. Um, let's throw another question. Um, if we could go uh, over here in the time. Thank you for coming to speak to us today. Uh, just a question about the, the upcoming position on Trident within the Labour Party. Now, the Labour Party's position and the one that Unite share is one of multilateral union, 
uh, nuclear disarmament. Jeremy Corbyn's a committed unilateralist. It looks as though the vote might go towards endorsing that position as party policy. Would Unite be in a position to oppose Jeremy Corbyn over that when it'll cost Unite members the jobs in areas like Barrow, places where the, the, the submarines are built? Yeah, actually, if I, act, uh, if I add till midnight, I might be able to explain Unite's policy on Trident. It's very complex and very nuanced. But let me say this. We are pro-jobs and pro-community. We understand the morality of nuclear weapons. We understand the cost. We understand what many in the military say, the uselessness. And the key to it all is diversification. What you do with these tens of thousands of workers and their communities, um, what do you do with them? You come from Barnsley, you'll have seen what happened when mining communities were destroyed and it destroys families. So what do you do? Well, the argument is you look at the div defence diversification. The problem is consecutive gov governments are not interested in defence diversification. Uh, including the last Labour government. In fact, it was the last Labour government that abolished in 2001 the Defence Diversification Agency. What Jeremy Corbyn has said is we should have a debate about that. Now, Unite is in favour of doing that, but the decision on Trident will be taken this year, probably, um, and the likelihood is that it will pass through Parliament easily because there's lots of Labour MPs who are in favour of Trident renewal and there's lots who are against it. Uh, we believe that Jeremy should announce fairly quickly that it's a free vote. Uh, people should be given a free vote, but there are arguments about that and they are important arguments. There's discussions taking place at the moment to see whether the Labour Party abstains, with the exception of obviously a few Labour MPs who are very committed to Trident. Um, either way, the uh, the issue is something that the media currently like to obsess on it because they think it's another split in the Labour Party. Actually, if we engage in proper debate, there's all kinds of things. For example, only the other day I found out a startling fact. Currently, 12% of our defence budget, that's the money, billions and billions of pounds, which is taxpayers' money, our money, 12% of that goes to America, where uh, it provides jobs for Americans. They pay their taxes and any profits into the American Treasury. By 2020, in four years' time, that figure will have gone up to 25%. It's staggering. Now, we should be arguing that. We should be challenging. This is, the, this is conventional uh, uh, defence as well, which the Conservative Party are all over the place on. And we should be challenging the Conservative Party on that. Um, Trident is getting slightly in the way at the moment. And of course it's important, but I don't believe it's as big a divisive issue as what the media are attempting. Unite will continue to defend our members irrespective of who the leader of the Labour Party is. And if that means we have to vote against Jeremy or anybody else, well, of course we'll do that. We're in business to defend our members' jobs and their communities, and we'll do that... Uh, w without fear or favour of anybody. Well, thank you very much for that question. That seems like a good place to end. So, Len, thank you very much for coming. Um, Len will be has very kindly agreed to read out a round of pub quiz afterwards. So, do make your way over. So to long the as bar. it's not in Latin, because so <laughs> I'm a bit rusty on that. Um, so, yes, if you could all please remain seated while Len leaves. But once again, thank you very much, Len McCluskey.